Hey guys, this is Landon with the Command Valley, bringing you another Commander Deck Tech. Thank you so much to GameGrid for sponsoring our channel. If you want to check out their new and improved store and support the channel while doing it, check out the link in the description below. We have a copy and pasteable deck list in the description that you can paste right in their deck builder and buy your singles there. Additionally, if you want to support the channel directly, you can head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash commandvalley to sign up today. All right, so for today's deck tech, I'm stepping a little outside of my comfort zone and hopefully making everybody else at the table equally as uncomfortable. That's right, today we're brewing up Liesa Shroud of Dusk. So let's take a look at Liesa and see what we're going to be doing with this deck. So she is a legendary creature angel that costs two, a white, a white, and a black. And she reads, rather than pay two generic mana for each previous time you've cast this spell from the command zone this game, pay two life that many times. She has flying and lifelink, and whenever a player casts a spell, they lose two life. And she's a 5-5, five five, which I think is pretty relevant. So there is a lot going on here. She gives a reduction for her commander tax, which is super powerful. Being able to always pay five mana for her, even if she's been killed a couple of times, is really strong, especially with the way I've built this deck. Flying and Lifelink is also really helpful. Um, she's going to be one of the ways we have of closing out games, so that's really relevant. And making it so whenever a player casts a spell that they lose two life is really powerful. Our opponents are going to be taking a lot of damage if they want to be casting spells. Although with this deck, we're going to be making it very difficult for our opponents to cast things, which is why I said in the beginning that it's a little uncomfortable for our opponents. So this deck is seeking to slow down our opponents to a painful halt restricting them on how many spells they can cast, where they can cast spells from, and how much mana they have to spend on their spells. We also have ways of draining life from them throughout the game, just in little increments that don't seem very relevant, but at the end of the game is very relevant. And then to close out the game, we're hoping to swing in with Liesa. She is a massive flying angel or swing in with all of the hate bears that we're going to be playing or stick a massive drain spell. Let's start off with our brief ramp package. Our opponents aren't going to be going anywhere fast with the pieces we have in our deck slowing them down. So we're not in a huge rush and we're not playing a ton of ramp spells. We've got Orzhov Signet, Arcane Signet, Wayfarer's Bauble for our mana rocks. We're not playing a ton of mana rocks. Like I said earlier, we are playing a lot of stacks pieces and hate bears, and we have ways of shutting off artifacts completely, so making it so they're not even able to be used, so we don't want to be relying too much on those. We've got Dark Ritual, which I just think is a good way of getting Liesa out super early or maybe ramping into one of our bigger spells. It's just a useful card. We then have Keeper of the Court. It's a new card. It came out in Commander Legends. I think it really belongs in this deck. Basically, at the beginning of each opponent's end step, if that player controls more lands than us, we can search our library for a basic play and put it into play tapped and then shuffle our library. You can also make tokens if somebody's got more creatures than us, but it's in the deck to help us get more lands into play. So like I said, at the beginning of this category, this might feel really light on the ramp, but we're playing a lot of things that shut artifacts off, a lot of things that either tax all of the spells or make it so you can only play one spell per turn. So really, we're just slowing the game down. We're not trying to do a crazy amount of stuff every turn. We're just trying to get a stack piece down every turn to make it so it's almost impossible for our opponents to play things. So for this next category, I'm kind of considering the spells in this deck that only let people play one spell per turn to be the most powerful stacks effects. So I'm going to go over them first. So starting off with Archon of Ameria, this is a super powerful stacks piece. Each player can only cast one spell per turn and all of our opponents non-basic lands are going to enter the battlefield tap. So that tapping down the lands is added benefit. It's really in here to make our opponents only be able to cast one spell per turn. Eidolon of Rhetoric is very similar to Archon of Ameria, similar mana costs. Each player can't cast more than one spell each turn. Then we have Aether Sworn Canonist. Each player who has cast a non-artifact spell this turn can't cast additional non-artifact spells. So in the fringe case where we're up against an artifact deck, this won't affect them too poorly, but a large majority of the time, this is really going to hose our opponent's turns. We then have Rule of Law, which is exactly the same of Eidolon of Rhetoric. It's just an enchantment. And then Deafening Silence is really efficient, coming in at just one white mana. And it actually kind of helps us because most of the cards in our deck are creatures. So it doesn't, it's not going to affect us hopefully as much as it's going to affect our opponents. So I really like these cards because sticking one of these really early in the game is going to be absolutely brutal, really going to slow our opponents down, and even sticking these in the late game or just in the mid game when our opponents are trying to develop their board states or come back from a deficit is going to really put a cap on how much they can do. So I think that these are probably the strongest stacks pieces in the game. All right, so continuing on with the theme of can't, let's look at some restrictions on when and where our opponents can play their spells. So we've got Draneth Magistrate that only lets our opponents play spells from their hands. So they can't play things from their graveyard, they can't play things from exile they can't even play their commanders if their commanders are still in the command zone so this is a brutal card it really shuts off a lot of strategies we then have ashes of the abhorrent and rest in peace which both really hose graveyard strategies 
Rest in Peace doesn't necessarily keep our opponents from casting things from the graveyard, but it kind of exiles everything from the graveyard and prevents things from going into the graveyard after it's on the battlefield, so these are really brutal. And Ashes of the Abhorrent has the added benefit of letting us gain a life whenever a creature dies, which is super useful. We've got a ton of board wipes, so this could gain us a lot of life throughout the game. And then we have Stony Silence, which is going to shut off all artifacts. All of their activated abilities cannot be activated. They can't tap their mana rocks for mana. They can't do anything like that. So that is a super powerful card. All right, now let's look at the ways we have of taxing our opponent's spells, making it even more difficult for them to develop their board state. Starting this off, we have Glow Rider, Thalia, Garden of Thraben, and Vren Wingmare, each of which add on an extra mana to spells our opponents cast. We then have Kataki's War Wage, which is some more artifact hate. If our opponents are finally able to stick some artifacts, they have to pay one mana for those every turn or else have to sacrifice them. We then have Damping Spear, which is going to shut off lands that tap for more than two mana, turning it basically into colorless mana instead of the color that it would have produced. So if our opponents have Bounce Lands or a Gaia's Cradle or Cabal Coffers, that's going to just turn that mana into just generic colorless mana. And each spell a player casts costs one more to cast for each other spell that player has cast this turn. So if our opponents are trying to have some type of storm turn and we haven't managed to stick one of our Eidolon of Rhetoric effects or Rule of Law effects, this is going to make it very difficult for that opponent to combo off or storm off. So let's say our opponents are finally able to stick a creature. These next cards will make it so even if that happens, they're still not going to gain very much. So Hushbringer, Hushwing Griff and Takatli Honor Guard are all going to make the enter the battlefield triggers of our opponent's creatures not happen. So like an Avenger of Zendikar or a Solemn Simulacrum or any type of powerful enter the battlefield trigger, a Sun Titan, for example, is just not going to happen. So you, even if they manage to stick that creature, they're not going to gain very much. So this next category is kind of my catch all stacksy cards. All of these cards just generally make it very difficult for our opponents to develop their game plan. Blind Obedience is going to make all of our opponents creatures and artifacts enter the battlefield tapped, which is really good at shutting off uh, mana rocks or creatures with haste. And that is extort ability being able to pay a one white or black mana every time we cast a spell to drain each of our opponents for one is also really useful. Thalia Heretic Cathar is very similar. It's going to make all of our opponents creatures enter the battlefield tapped and their non basic lands are going to enter the battlefield tapped as well. We then have Containment Priest as one of those gacha cards. We can flash it in, and if a non-token creature would enter the battlefield and it wasn't cast, we can exile it instead. So if our opponents have ways of cheating things into play from the top of their library, from their hand, from their graveyard, non-Containment Priest is just going to exile that card and get rid of it. We then have Avon Mind Sensor, which is another one of those gacha cards with flash. If an opponent would search their library, instead they only search the top four cards of their library instead. So we can really neuter one of our opponent's tutors. Maybe they're trying to go find a piece to get rid of our stacks pieces, so Avon Mind Sensor is really good at uh, preventing them from doing that. We then have Kumbal, Console of Allocation, who is very similar to our commander. Whenever an opponent casts a non-creature spell, that player loses two life and we gain two life. So this is going to add an additional life loss to our opponents playing spells, and we're going to gain life as well. So this is super useful in the deck. You could also put Kumbal, Console of Allocation, in the command zone, put Liesa in the deck if you get bored of playing her. Uh, the deck would function very similarly. We then have Spirit of the Labyrinth, which makes it so each player can't draw more than one card each turn. So this is going to further keep our opponents from finding answers to what we're doing. We're then playing Norn's Annex and Revenge of Ravens. These kind of help keep our opponents from swinging at us a lot. So Norn's Annex makes it so creatures can't attack us or a Planeswalker we control unless their controller pays a Phyrexian white mana for each of those creatures. So if our opponents aren't in white and they have no way of generating white mana, they have to pay two life for each of the creatures that they are attacking us with, which is absolutely brutal since we're going to be chipping away at their life total throughout the game with our extort triggers, with our commanders. So it's gonna be very difficult for them to justify attacking us. And then Revenge of Ravens also makes it very difficult for our opponents to justify attacking us. For each creature that they attack us with, they're going to lose one life and we're going to gain one life. So let's say things go terribly wrong. We kept a hand that didn't have very much stacks or our opponents were able to deal with our stacks before it got out of control. And they've been able to amass some type of army. Hope is not all lost. We've got some cards in the deck which can set our opponents back to the Stone Age. So we've got Austere Command and Cleansing Nova. Each of these can deal with a lot of different things. Austere Command has a bunch of different modes from which we can choose two. We can destroy all artifacts, destroy all enchantments, destroy all creatures with converted mana cost three or less, or destroy all creatures with converted mana cost four or greater. 
greater. So let's say we've got a bunch of stacks of pieces already. You know, we've been able to place some after our opponents developed their board. Austere Command can basically wipe away our opponent's big creatures while leaving us with our smaller creatures, or we can destroy all the artifacts or all the enchantments that our opponents have decided to play or any combination of those. So it's just a really flexible board wipe. Cleansing Nova can destroy all creatures or destroy all artifacts and enchantments, depending on the board state, really depends on which one of these modes is going to be most useful. And then we've got some good old fashioned board wipes with Day of Judgment and Dusk. Dusk also has Dawn, which is really useful. We can return all creatures with power two or less from our graveyard to our hand. We've got a lot of creatures in a deck that, uh, that have power two or less. So if we have had to wipe the board with Dusk, um, we can bring those back to our hand with Dawn, so that's really nice. We then have Hour of Revelation, which is going to cost three generic mana less if there are 10 or more non-land permanents on the battlefield, and we destroy all non-land permanents. We then have Kaya's Wrath, which is going to destroy all creatures, and we are going to gain life equal to the number of creatures that we control that were destroyed this way. And then we have Fumigate, which is going to blow up all the creatures on the battlefield, and we're going to gain one life for each creature destroyed this way. So if only a few problematic creatures or permanents have been able to get through and a wrath isn't really warranted because we've got a pretty good board state, we're prepared to deal with that as well. We then have Dispark, which can deal with any non-land permanent that costs four or more, completely exiling it. We then have Disenchant, which can destroy target, artifact, or enchantment. We then have Swords to Plowshares and Path to Exile, very cheap one mana exile creature spells. Generous Gift can blow up any permanent and they get a 3-3 elephant for their troubles. We then have Mortify, which can kill any creature or kill any enchantment, which is very useful. We then have Heliod's intervention which at instant speed we destroy x target artifacts and or enchantments or target player is going to gain twice x life more often than not we're going to want to be blowing up the artifacts and enchantments and then we have a card that i'm really excited about putting in this deck because it has a lot of synergy with our commander and it is font of agonies so whenever we pay life we put that many blood counters on font of agonies so whenever we pay life to cast our commander we're going to be putting a ton of counters on this we can pay one and a black to remove the four blood counters from Font of Agonies to destroy target creature. So this is repeatable removal that has a lot of synergy with our commander. And there are other ways we have in the deck of paying life, so we are not just relying on our commander for that. And then finally, we have Darksteel Mutation. The enchanted creature becomes a 0-1 insect artifact creature with indestructible and loses all other abilities. If we can put this on one of our opponent's commanders, it's going to take that commander basically out of the game for a long time. So I've called this next category a little bit of value. This deck doesn't have a ton of card draw or ways of digging for cards in our deck, and that's just because we're going to be slowing down the game a lot, um, and hopefully just drawing one card per turn is going to be enough to keep us at parity with our opponents only being able to draw one card per turn or play one thing down each turn. So we've got Siphon Mind, which is going to make each of our opponents dis discard a card, and we're going to be able to draw three cards. We then have Mentor of the Meek, which whenever another creature with power two or less enters a battlefield under our control, we can pay one mana, and if we do, we get to draw a card. Since some of these stacks effects affect us too, and we're only going to be able to play one card per turn like our opponents, we're going to have a bunch of extra mana around, so being able to pay that extra one tax on our creatures to draw a card is very much worth it. We then have Villas Broker of Blood, which I think is probably one of my favorite demons. It's just a really cool card. Uh, so it has flying, it's an 8-8, and we can pay one black mana and pay two life to give target creature minus one, minus one until end of turn. And whenever we lose life, we're going to draw that many cards. So if we cast our commander from the command zone and we pay like 10 life because it's been killed a bunch of times, we're gonna be drawing 10 cards. So even though we're not playing a ton of cards that let us draw a lot of cards, we are playing some really, really efficient ones. And then we have Immortal Servitude. So this is a really interesting card. It lets us return cards from our graveyard to the battlefield. So we can return each creature card with converted mana cost X or less from our graveyard to the battlefield. And you'll notice that a lot of our hate bears are in that two to three mana range. So depending on what we need from our graveyard and what our graveyard is filled with, we can really return a lot of our hate bears from the graveyard to the battlefield. So at this point, if we've managed to stick one to two pieces from each of our stacks categories while using our spot removal and board wipes when necessary, when things get out of control, our opponents are really going to be hating life. And after several turns of this oppressive wave of stacks, it'll probably be time to finish the game. So these cards are going to be our prime finishers. These are the best cards in the deck that we have of closing out the game. So we've got Torment of Hellfire, Debt to the Deathless, Exsanguinate, and Court of Ambition. So, so Torment of Hellfire is going to let us repeat the following process X times. Each opponent loses three life unless that player sacrifices a non-land permanent or discards a card. So if we pump 10 mana into this, it's just gonna end the game. Our opponents are gonna die. They're not gonna be able to um, discard that many cards or sacrifice that many permanents. 
Especially if we've been able to stack them out, blow up the board, you know, keep their boards nice and clean. It's just going to end the game. Debt to the Deathless is going to make each opponent lose two times X life, and we're going to gain life equal to the life lost this way. And Exsanguinate is going to make each opponent lose X life, and we're going to gain life equal to the total amount of life lost this way. We then have Court of Ambition, which is kind of a slower kill, but when it enters the battlefield, we are going to become the Monarch. And at the beginning of our upkeep, each opponent is going to lose three life unless they discard a card. And if we are the Monarch at the beginning of our turn, instead, each opponent is going to to lose six life unless they discard two cards so if they are running out of cards in their hand this is going to take them out of the game pretty quickly these next ones aren't quite as reliable but they can do the job we've got blood artist which is going to be able to drain somebody every time a creature dies and we're going to gain a life and then gray merchant of asphodel when it enters a battlefield is going to make each opponent lose x life and we're going to gain x life where x is our devotion to black and then we have Tithe Drinker, which is kind of a weird card to put in the win con section. It kind of has some synergy with the next card I'm going to talk about, but I really like Extort in this deck. It can add up damage throughout the game really quickly if our opponents aren't paying attention. And like I said, it has really good synergy with a, a card in the next category that I'm going to talk about. So this last category that I'm going to be talking about is Combat. Our commander is a really powerful flying angel. So a Chroma's Will is really fitting in this deck. We get to choose one of these unless we control our commander, we get to choose both so creatures we control gain flying vigilance and double strike until the end of turn or creatures we control gain lifelink and indestructible and protection from all colors until the end of turn so if we have our commander all of our creatures are going to gain flying vigilance double strike lifelink indestructible and protection from all colors until the end of turn if we have our commander out and we've been able to amass a ton of hate bears this is going to end the game and then we have light of promise which is a super inconspicuous card, but I think is really powerful with our commander. The enchanted creature has, whenever you gain life, put that many plus one plus one counters on this creature. So this is going to have synergy with all of our extort triggers, including the tithe drinker. And it has a lot of synergy with our commander or any of our other drain spells. So with this on our commander, we really don't have to have any of our extort cards or any of our drain spells. Hitting an opponent with a five five flying lifelink angel and it getting five plus one plus one counters each of those times is very powerful. And this card will help us close out the game very quickly and finally let's go over the mana base so we are running for non-basic lands a cave of koilos a commands tower a concealed courtyard an exotic orchard a fetid heath an isolated chapel an orzov basilica a scoured barons a tainted field and a temple of silence and we are playing 15 plains and 12 swamps Thank you guys so much for tuning into this week's episode. I really hope that you enjoy the deck and that your opponents definitely do not enjoy the deck. <laughs> in all seriousness, no, you should probably let your opponents know or the people that you're playing with know that you're playing a very stacky kind of oppressive deck. Uh, a lot of people might not have too much fun playing against this deck. Some people do like that aspect of puzzle solving and, and getting around all these stacks pieces, but that's not for everybody. So just make sure you give your playgroup a heads up that you're going to be bringing this level of stacks into the game. If there are any stacks pieces that you would have put in this deck or other cards that you would have liked to see in this deck, let me know down in the comment section below. I was keeping budget in mind. I was trying not to include too many cards that were 15 to $20 or more. And a lot of the stacks pieces kind of fell into that price range. So if there, like I said, if there are any cards that you would have liked to see in this deck definitely let us know in the comment section below and just a couple of quick reminders here in the close if you are looking to support us directly you can head on over to patreon.com slash command valley you get access to exclusive content our discord merch and a ton of other perks and another reminder that if you are interested in purchasing this deck or singles from this deck going through the link in the description below will help the channel out a ton and they ship nationwide now so you can get your cards wherever you're at in america another reminder that we are live streaming every tuesday at 7 p.m mountain standard time and you can join us for some brawl on arena and then a reminder to follow us on social medias our handles for those are command valley p1 and you can like us on facebook and links for all of that will be in the description below again thank you guys so much for tuning into today's episode we really appreciate all of our subscribers our viewers and our patreons we really couldn't do this without you guys and i hope you guys have a wonderful week